So uh, welcome one and all to this Arasha talk. Lovely to have you with us. My name is Matt Humphrey. I work as an educator for Arasha Canada, among many other things, other hats that I wear. And I'm grateful to come to you today from the beautiful lands here, the ancestral unceded lands of the Lekwungen speaking people, part of the Coast Salish peoples here in Victoria, British Columbia. And I recognize many of you joining us from, from near and far. So welcome wherever you are. It's great to have you with us. I want to begin with that gratitude for those who have cared and tended the land on which I am, past, present, and future, and honor the lives of all who have come before. And gratitude for the opportunity to be together in this very strange technological medium to consider this topic. All of you are welcome. Welcome on my behalf, and then certainly on behalf of uh, Arasha Canada. A brief word about Arasha if you're new to it. Arasha is a global network of projects, uh, a faith-based Christian uh, environmental organization. We're community-based, we work broadly in nature conservation, but it takes very different shapes in the 21 or so countries in which we work around the world. We started in Portugal in 1983. So Arrocha means the rock in Portuguese, and um, Andrea can correct my Portuguese later. Um, but it's adapted to the needs of diverse bioregions and watersheds around the world, and it's grown into this beautiful kind of uh, quirky, small but large network of, of projects. In Canada, our mission of transforming people in places through showing God's love for creation, that's our mission and our vision, and that's carried out primarily through uh, three study centers, one outside Vancouver, British Columbia, one in Hamilton, Ontario, and another in Winnipeg, Manitoba, but also through some smaller but really important partnered projects that happen in northern BC, something brewing here in Victoria and in other parts of Canada. So the centers demonstrate our kind of commitment to care for creation in diverse ways, but hold a kind of common set of values. And if you haven't been to one of the Arasha centers, I would encourage you to think about doing that. Um, and let me also say, as an educator with Arasha, part of my work is hosting these sorts of conversations, but explicitly with faith groups and churches and Christian organizations. And so if there are ways that I could nurture that for you or be in conversation with you or your church or group, I'm happy to do that. Um, I will drop my email, which most of you have through registration, but I'll drop that in the chat and feel free to reach out to me and see if there's ways that we could collaborate. So welcome on behalf of myself and of Arasha. These Arasha talks are meant to be a kind of dialogue about core issues as it relates both to our life in this world and of being creatures and, of course, our life of faith. And special welcome today to Ellen Kelsey, who's written this wonderful little book, um, which I mentioned we had a group that read together through June and has joined us to offer her learning to us. I met Ellen in a graduate course in environmental education here in Victoria and was immediately impressed with her down to earth kind of conversational approach to learning. Um, she really saw the students as co-learners and really co-teachers and her own wonder for the world that we're in, I think took shape as we held class on, on beaches and along streams and under the shade of trees and, and even inside a massive tree on the campus of Royal Roads, I think some kind of sprawling cedar tree with students perched on yeah. branches and laying down and I was sort of leaned back across a few. Um, so we had just a wonderful experience of learning and I, I, I share that anecdote to give you kind of the human side of Ellen, who of course is a, a writer and a researcher and an educator. Um, and has drawn this theme of hope and environmental care and action over several decades of her work. Um, a, a, an ethic of hope that I think is, is a core value for Arasha really, um, and one that Ellen lives out and embodies in both her personal and professional life. So her work is at the heart of environmental care and particularly, and tell me if I'm wrong, Ellen, um, <laughs> I do see a, a sort of wonder at the world we live in that drives much of your research. So. One of the most moving chapters in the book was about the reciprocal relationships between humans and other creatures, how we can see the agency of other creatures as they respond to environmental changes and challenges. Um, something that is easy for us to overlook, to not pay attention to, right? To not be able to see in a kind of human centric frame. Um, and which, as you pointed out to me, some of our most sophisticated climate models don't really account for other creatures agency and how they might respond. They focus just on, on ours. So more, of course, on all that to say, 
um, but, but such rich work and research that you bring to bear here, Ellen. So thank you for joining us for this conversation. Lovely to have oh, you. You're welcome, Matt. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And it's just funny, I keep opening the windows here and closing them as different um, trucks come by. Um, I really must apologize to all of you for, for meeting you in the back of a Safeway just uh, north of Tacoma, Washington. <laughs> when Matt finally invited me to do this talk, I, I yeah. thought I would be in Victoria. Yeah. Um, but now I'm, I'm in transit, heading back to Pacific Grove where I, I normally do spend a bit of time. So i just close that up. I'm very, very happy to be with all of you. And, and really, I think the idea behind Hope Matters, what really drives it, is that for the many decades that I've been involved in environmental communications and education, this narrative of doom and gloom, you know, this idea that everything was wonderful and is now wrecked, mm -hmm. is a really dominant narrative, which we, we, we sort of live it almost as a truth. And I, I've been quite fortunate in my life to work in different countries, work on different projects, work with lots of children and adults. And in each of those cases, I was always struck by how strong this feeling of doom and gloom is and how often when we're talking about the environment, we're talking about what we think. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that we think about what we feel. Mm -hmm. And so this notion of doom and gloom being this dominant narrative became quite interesting to me because it's easy to think that these narratives are kind of neutral and that they don't have much impact. But what we've really learned in, in recent years is that this doom and gloom narrative is reinforced in the media that we see. Uh, we know that you know over 90% of what uh, we see in the media about the environment is in this problem identification mode. So we hear lots about what's not working. And that's important because we have these global issues that are, are urgent and important. Yeah. But what ends up happening is we can be left with this impression that um, there are no you know, no wins are being made or that we're just at the starting line. It's what I like to call the starting line fallacy. Right. And we even reinforce this when we, we often talk about if we do this, then that will happen, hmm. which implies that nothing has yet happened. And I think I try really hard in my own life to say, because we have been doing these things, hmm. these things are now happening. And I think a really great example of that, I, um, I was lucky enough to work on what was at the time the world's largest marine protected area, which George Bush, the former president, um, we were trying to convince him to establish that as his final act of leaving office. You know, he would have this blue legacy. And so in 2008, I was working with the Pew Charitable Trust to try and establish what would be then the world's largest marine protected area in the Marianas Trench, the deepest ocean canyon in the world. Mm. Um, happy to say we were successful and it was the world's largest marine protected area. And I think now it's something like the 14th or 15th largest marine protected area. So just in that, you know, decade in a few years, right. the number of ecosystem scaled marine protected areas has, has really blossomed. And we now see 71 countries who have signed on to this idea of protecting 30% of land and water by 2030. And when we were working on that marine protected area, you know, it was less than less than 1%. Mm -hmm. And so watching these trends that are emerging, you know, of course we have to hold politicians to these commitments, you know, there's lots of challenges around marine protection, but to watch that amplification of a really important idea mm -hmm. and, and watch it move globally is, is really exciting. And so, what I'm interested in is amplifying those things that are evidence-based and that are having the kinds of positive impacts that we need. Mm -hmm. And I think what's exciting to me about this 30% declaration of land and water across these 71 countries is that it, it marks the first time that the biodiversity convention, so this huge international convention we have across 191 countries um, around the protection of of species diversity and ecosystem diversity is actually in partnership with the climate change agreement. And so recognizing what Greta Thunberg and others talk about natural climate solutions, which is really about um, protecting and restoring lands and waters, uh, watching that happen on an international basis is really exciting. So that's one area that I think is really worth paying attention to and seeing. And, and in Hope Matters, what I, what I really was trying to do was talk about 
um, the danger of staying with the gloom and doom narrative mm -hmm. because it's very disempowering and it's really disengaging. And a, a friend of mine, Ellen Field, who's an academic at Lakehead University, she just did a study um, that came out in 2020 of students between the ages or, or grades, grade seven and 12 across Canada. And what she found is that the um, majority of those students were very aware of climate change. They were very aware that it was human caused. Mm -hmm. And 46% of those students in those grades thought there was nothing that could be done about it. Mm -hmm. And Michael Mann, a very well-known climate scientist, he talks about climate doomism is now kind of what was climate denial. Because if you think things are doomed, then you really don't have to do anything about them. Um, so it's another form of disengagement. Mm -hmm. And um, Tony Lieserwitz, who's at Yale University, he talks about this. Um, what we've really seen in the last decade is this real rise in levels of people's awareness and concern about climate change across socioeconomic levels and across many countries. And as that increased knowledge and awareness has gone up, we see at the same time um, what he calls a hope gap, hmm. which is increasing sense that there's not anything we can do about it. So, so that's why I think hope is so essential. Evidence-based hope is so essential to all this because at the very time we want people to be highly aware of these issues, which is wonderful. We don't want to be inadvertently fueling disengagement and disempowerment and lack of agency. So hmm. that's, that's really what this book is all about. And, um, I'm, I'm so excited to talk to book club people who have been reading it because I often find, you know, a careful read of a good reader uh, raises all kinds of things that I may have been talking about and wasn't even aware of, you know, so it's lovely to have this kind of conversation. Yeah. Well, th thank you for that. That's such a great start for us. And yeah, so book club people, but all of you feel free to uh, enter yep. your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll keep going and then kind of filtering those in as, as we're able. Um, that's really helpful, I think, Ellen, that, that kind of context uh, within which this project came to be and your, I think, real concern on the real world impact of this, this awareness. And I've experienced this as a parent of, of pretty young kids. My oldest has just turned 11 and I, I didn't encounter anything like this as a 10, 11 year old in school and how, how we help equip people for that. And I guess I'm curious, you know, what, so you, you mentioned the study of, of younger folk, and I certainly, having been around the kind of college and university scene doing some teaching, I'm aware of how this problem uh, can, can totally uh, flatten people, right? With all, and, and whether it's uh, ecological anxiety or fear or grief, and the tools to actually work through that, right, are often not taught in the same classes that you're given all that really important data about the world. Um, so I guess a two-part sort of question, how, how might the challenge of that be something experienced by, by you, by folk joining us on this call? But then also, I, I see you offering uh, sort of hope-based news as an, as an antidote, um, but, but how would you help us to also deal with some of the difficult emotions that those things bring up? How do you, how do you sort of hold that together? Yeah, it's, oh, thank you. That's such a good question. So this last year during COVID, I was lucky enough to work with the International Association of Educators, like a very loose network of people who got together, who are all really interested in this idea of emotions and engagement as relates to climate justice education. And so we created this existential toolkit for climate justice educators, which is a mouthful, but if you just... Yeah. Google, you know, existential toolkit for climate justice educators, you'll be able to see hmm. this amalgamation of lots of kinds of materials for educators and students, um, which are really all about creating safe spaces for people to express their feelings. Um, and Lisa Kretz, who's a wonderful philosophy uh, prof, she talks about outlaw emotions, how we have these ideas um, that that there's certain emotions we're not allowed to share, like fear or guilt or shame or these kinds of things. Um, and that really, we, we don't just feel hopeful, you know, we feel a range of emotions at any given time. And so creating safe places for us to express those emotions. And I would say that's probably the most important thing when you're having a conversation with someone about climate change is, is to really try and gauge how they're feeling and, and really listen to those feelings in the first place. Mm. And then when, when 
when there's space for that, I, I think that what we often find is that our, what we think is a divide between someone caring or not caring or whatever, often what you find is underneath it, there's, there's a very strong feeling of concern mm -hmm. and it may be coming from a different value and, and listening for those values is helpful too. Mm -hmm. So I think listening and really making space for emotions, which has not been a common part of the way we think about climate change is, is integral. Yeah. And then I think second thing is there has been this real growth in in what's called um, solutions journalism and solutions journalism I, the reason I think it's so apropos to this is as I said the the number one way that most of us hear about the environment is through the media and that and we know that we're now in 24 7 media circuits you know that we get media through our personal feeds through our social media feeds yeah. and so um, this awareness that the majority of media we're hearing about climate change and other environmental issues is in this problem identification mode is, is an important sort of media health issue. Right. And in solution journalism, what's going on there is these, uh, you know, really large journalism outlets like The Guardian, The New York Times, others who are saying, you know, it's only half the news if we only talk about what's broken and that we need to use the same kind of rigorous reporting to look at what's what things are having a positive impact, whether that be around school shootings or other forms of violence or, um, you know, miss, you know, communities that are very underrepresented in terms of climate change, um, these sorts of things. And what's been great is to watch the emergence of the Solutions Journalism Network and others, you know, Grist, uh, which is a, a wonderful media outlet. They do something called the Beacon, which you can get on a you know, if you want to, as an email that comes to you once a week, that that's intentionally looking at which things are working and what's the evidence behind them so that they could then be tailored or, or actually even used a, from a political standpoint to say, hey, if you can do this in Albuquerque, I'm pretty sure we could do it in Nanaimo, you know, these sorts of ideas. Right. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Um, I think the that, as you say, that that gap of helping people the, the, the range of emotions that come out around climate in particular, but I think, I mean, a lot of environmental issues, more local ones too, can really tap into our sense of security and safety and identity with the, the rivers that we love, et cetera. But something about the nature of climate that the, that the world itself is unstable can be so destabilizing. And so tools to be able to do that. You, um, one of the interesting things in this book is you, I said in the book group, I feel like you continue, you keep coming around to doing what I call a bit of throat clearing. You know, you offer your argument and then you sort of say, <clears throat> okay, what I'm not saying is this. Don't, don't hear me saying, right. Oh yeah. You're really scared and afraid. Just read a different story and have hope. You know, <laughs> you're not, you're not, it's not nearly that simple. And so I thought I'd give you a chance. What are, what are some of those common kind of rebuttals you feel like you have to offer um, is there is there pushback against the idea that we should have some reason to be hopeful? How do you encounter that? Yeah, I would say one of the number one things, uh, Matt, is that often when you talk about the importance of hope, uh, people make an assumption that we have to use fear because if we don't use fear, people will become complacent. And there's a real concern around complacency that somehow if you talk about things that are moving in the kinds of directions we need them to be going, that you will be, con you'll, you'll create some impression within people that, okay, I don't need to do anything because everything's going to be fine. Right. But what is really intriguing about that is that when you look across the psychological liter uh, literature, there's very little correlation between hopefulness and complacency, but there's a very strong correlation between hopelessness and disempowerment. Hmm. And so in fact, there's strong relationships between pride. So if you feel that you are part of a collective that is having a positive impact, you're much more likely to stay working hard on things when they're tough hmm. and really difficult to do. It, hmm. It's very motivating, intrinsically motivating. Whereas if you are consistently told what's broken and, and you don't have a sense that any forward momentum is being made, then what we tend to do is become self-isolating. Mm -hmm. We tend to be self-recriminating and we tend to give up, shut down, or, you know, really feel um, helpless. Yeah. And what's intriguing in emotions to me is that anger and hope are both very activating emotions. When we feel angry about something that's unjust, mm -hmm. 
we're really motivated to deal with it. But things like shame and grief and hopelessness and helplessness, those are very deactivating emotions. They tend to cause us to um, not take very much action. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really crucial because these issues we face are, are critically important and are quite urgent. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really teasing out the complexity of emotions and seeing that we feel all of them and how important it is to move in the direction of activating emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's that's really helpful. And I think, um, again, it reinforces this sense that to really do this sort of work, I mean, just perhaps to just be a, you know, a creature in the world, um, there is a kind of inner work to that, right, of facing those complex emotions, um, the fear, the anxiety, the the risk, uh, to some extent, just our, our own vulnerability, right, um, such that we can then actually be free to see other other kind of data points, right? Um, I worked with somebody in a college university context uh, years ago, and um, you know it was like everything that came out of the that particular university administration was proof that they didn't get it. They weren't a part of it. and and you just sort of thought they are there are some counter signs, but but actually processing through that, right is is complex and difficult. And that's you know your employer, but when you're talking about the the, the ecosystem that we live we live upon, um, perhaps a bit more different. I, I yeah. want to, um, I guess I want to pivot us. And again, feel free uh, those of you who are on, and some of you who joined us uh, as we got going. If you have questions, pop those in the chat. We are monitoring those, and I will get around to them. Perhaps one more from me is you know I um, speaking about hope is I, I think a natural place. For, for myself, for the work that Arasha does coming from a faith perspective, you know, there is something transcendent, right, to, to the kind of hope we have. It's, uh, and, and yet there's a, there's a temptation or a danger in that, right? One of my um, professors at seminary used to say that, you know, Christians can be so heavenly minded, they're of no, no earthly good. <laughs> um, <laughs> or he's, you know, his other good line, he would say that faith isn't just about pie in the sky when we die, you know, by and by, but it's also about uh, cake on the plate while we wait. <laughs> um, and you, you, you look at mindfulness here, right, as a, a practice that you advocate that can, that can help us. And yet um, there's even a temptation in that, right, that, that perhaps our, our sense of the, the, the world is so out of control, but I can through a little bit of practice, you know, achieve some peace within that, 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 that might sort of say, I, I can just stick with this, that this is enough. And yet the kind of hope you're talking about, it may actually be anchored in a bigger picture, uh, something that can be transcendent, yet it does actually draw us in more deeply. Can you say a little bit about that, how that comes across for you writing out of your context and the, the folk you're engaging? Yeah, I really appreciate it. And I love those uh, phrases. I'm going to remember those. Um, I think one of the things that really intrigues me right now is how the climate change movement is very much a youth driven movement. And we know that 42% of the world right now is 25 years of age or younger, you know, so we live in a very young planet. Yeah think about it. And when you look across the values that across socioeconomic and ge geography, people are in that age group, the two values that keep coming up are social justice and climate change. They're, those are really, really important. And I, the reason I'm, I'm going to that when I'm thinking about your question, Matt, is that um, when you look at what youth are asking for around this, they're asking for a transformation, not about sustainability, but a transformation of the way that we live on the planet. And part of that transformation is around collective care and self-care. Mm -hmm. I find that really intriguing because in the same way that, that I would say people my age or you know closer to my age have thought about climate change and left out emotions, mm -hmm. I would say that amongst this younger group, which is a much bigger group demographically, emotions and self-care and community care are very high so things like mindfulness and kindness and and the ways that we we maintain ourselves so that we have the capacity to do difficult work um, when you look at, at student guides for example made by university students around climate change there's a beautiful one coming out of the university of manchester for example or the city of manchester 
and and self-care and community care are right up there. And I think when you look at Fairy Creek and uh, what's going on around old growth forests, that's another good example where collective care and self-care is being talked about as much as the issues themselves, because we recognize high incidence of burnout. We recognize that, that these are difficult issues in yeah. which we're engaged. And if we don't care for ourselves. So I think it was important to put in these, these practices, which can, can lead to self-care without worrying that that again leads to complacency. I, th I think that it, that, we're much more likely to see people get burned out and unable to engage in the things they care most about uh, right. because they're not taking care. Um, and that's why I thought it was so important to have those in the book and to, I'm excited, you know, there's now a center for altruism and compassion at Stanford University. There's a center for kindness studies at Yale University, I believe it's Yale. Um, you know, so we see that the recognition of, of, um, self-care, self-kindness is, is really an integral part of the way we engage with existential crisis kinds of issues. Yeah. Yeah. That's really helpful. And I think that, you know, that perhaps brings to another thing that your book is, is fascinating because as you say, that's a new conversation, right? That's emerging. And so mm -hmm. many of the kinds of conversations you tap into, um, are these kind of emerging fields. So you have a whole reflection, a chapter that gets into epigenetics, right? Which I, uh, you know, I can date myself. I graduated university in 2005. I, epigenetics wasn't in my textbooks, right? At that point in time. So that's not a long period of time. Um, and now this amazing field of how, you know, environmental and other sort of contextual factors can express our genes differently. I want to, give you a chance to talk about that. And, and that's connected with this kind of interspecies agency, the way that we see other creatures. <clears throat> Probably the most remarkable chapter for many of the book club was that <laughs> chapter of other creatures. And I wish I had a little Cole's notes of the story. So maybe <laughs> if you have an example um, for, for folk who are on the call here and how these new fields are really changing the way that we think about what other creatures' experiences are. We can't ever fully know, right? We don't, I don't live as a dolphin, I live as a, as a human. And yet what we're observing and understanding, it, the complexity is growing. Could you say a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So I'm really interested in this, Matt, this, the fact that we are one of 8.7 million other species on earth, you know? So there are a lot of other species and they are active and engaged and, and doing things. And so one of the examples in Hope Matters is, is this recovery of humpback whales, for example. So humpback whale populations, all but two, I believe, have been actively recovering um, since the end of commercial whaling. And what's been really exciting about that to me is that, you know, Fred Sharp, this wonderful humpback whale researcher says, is that, well, I know that they've many of those populations have been recovering faster than models predicted. And he thinks it's because they're really good social networkers. You know, they're very aware of what each other's doing. And, uh, you know, if there's a technique for feeding that works particularly well with one group, another group will pick up on it super quickly. And what's exciting as we watch these whale recoveries, what we see is the recovery of fisheries. And so, because as whales move around in the water, they're, they're moving a lot of water up and down the water column, um, which means you get all kinds of phytoplankton, which are the tiny plants, you know, at, that move up near the surface and you get all the zooplankton moving around. And so not only do we see recoveries of fisheries that are now tied to recoveries of whales and, and stronger ecosystem resilience, but also now we have economists who are climate economists who are showing that as whale, re whale recoveries are happening, the amount of carbon being captured through this phytoplankton is going up and they're placing the value of an individual whale at over a million dollars in terms of carbon recapture. So I really think uh, our capacity to see that agency and then build it into the way we think about uh, climate change responses is really important. And one of the big things happening with whales, for example, is recognition of different cultures of whales. So we knew that killer whales, for example, off the coast of British Columbia have three different major cultures, you know, residents who eat salmon and have their own dialects and each pod has its own dialect and, and 
hunting techniques. And then of course, bigs or, or transient killer whales who eat only marine mammals, and they've lived in the same area across 40,000 generations and haven't interbred, you know? But wow. now in the last couple of years, we see culture being identified in blue whales and in, in fin whales. And now I just finished a podcast for Hackeye Magazine on, on sounds and how we look at ocean soundscapes. And one of the things I did was uh, interviewed all these fish biologists who are saying in the last few years, culture of fish that we're recognizing through their sounds is really coming to the fore. So as fields emerge, we have a much, I think we can gain much more complexity of understanding about how much agency there is in the world around us. Yeah. And in terms of genetics, um, there's a wonderful example in Hope Matters of fish on coral reefs and their capacity to be able to deal with uh, warmer water temperatures right. um, and lower oxygen levels if baby fish are raised in uh, lower oxygen water and warmer water with their parents. So as their parents respond, then in fact, those genes that already exist to be able to deal with those higher temperatures are activated and the babies benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So it's in no way saying, don't worry, you know, every, everyone's genetics will just make it fine. But what it is saying is there's much more complexity of resilience than we were previously aware of, which mm -hmm. means now we see scientists looking at how do we increase our the resilience of corals, for example, or fish, um, as we are also tackling keeping those carbon levels down and decreasing them. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, and you, you have a great, I think you quote a friend of yours or a scientist talking about, um, was it, was it, uh, was it humpback whales, the ones that would rush in when, when something was being attacked? And you, and, and you summarize and, and said, how would we describe this? And they said, well, if we saw a similar behavior in humans, we would call it compassion, but we can't, science doesn't really let us use that word around other <laughs> creatures. So we have to call it instinct. And I thought how fascinating that th this behavior that quite obviously you can tell the story, but quite obviously is, is, you know, a, a kind of caring for someone in pain. Uh, we observe parallel behaviors in humans, but we cast it differently. And that, that fascinated the, the group. Do you, do you recall the story I'm mentioning? Yeah, absolutely. So there's over 190 recorded on video uh, examples of humpback whales rushing in when an animal is being threatened by killer whales. And it may be other humpbacks, sometimes it's ocean sunfish types of fishes, sometimes it's seals, uh, but they rush in um, and, and sort of intervene. Mm -hmm. And what was intriguing to me was that particular scientist who was looking at this work really, really didn't want to, and in some ways believe that this was happening. Right. And so it made for the best kind of science because it was irrefutable in terms of what was being observed. Right. Um, and why I think that distinction between compassion and in instinct is it just shows sort of the times we're in. Um, years ago, I guess about 20 years, I wrote a book about whales that was all based on first person interviews with scientists. And at that time, we couldn't even talk about culture. It was it was called the C word, you know, so the scientists would say, well, there's the C word, you know, and yeah. now we have actually a UN convention that recognizes culture as integral to the conservation of, of cetaceans. And so we do move with ideas. And I think that's part of what gives me a lot of hope is that we're not static and stuck. Uh, you know, these species we're talking about are not static and stuck, nor is our understanding of them. Yeah. And the more that we are open to what is happening around us, the more I think we can make good decisions like putting in a UN convention that recognizes culture. Yeah. Um, whereas 20 years ago, we couldn't even say the word. So yeah. it's, it's pretty interesting to watch. And I suppose that's one of the things I like about being the age I am is that you really recognize that these trends shift yeah. And that's why it's important to pay attention to what people who are 25 and younger are talking about, because those trends are really dramatically shifting and they are not talking about um, what I was talking about at 25. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> I think that is really important. And um, I think there's a kind of, um, I mean, you mentioned, right? You mentioned the, sort of the younger generation's um, interest in this and there is a kind of impatience right we want we want the world to improve and it and in fact we demand it improves and and on a whole yeah. range of issues social and, and ecological I think yeah amen let's let's push that and yet I do think um, you know the kind of some of the kind of change we're after is going to take 
it's going to take time and, and it's going to be complex. And so seeing that as you see that over 20 years, 30 years, you see the kind of change you're talking about. And even our capacity, um, I mean, my, my own, I'll, I'll confess, right? I've studied some of this stuff and yet my own just awe at other creatures' abilities was expanded in this book, right? Having lived and taught many of this sort of thing, but the, the and realized, all right, that, that compassion and instinct, I could see and I could see that in myself, right? The way I would, I would probably caricature it different for a whale than for a human. And even, yeah, I'm still kind of human centered like that, that, but that to have that expanded by what we learn, I think that capacity is so beautiful. Yeah. And we've had, you know, a lot of, since, you know, really all the way back to Aristotle has been reinforced this idea of sort of humans at the top separation or whatever. So there's a lot of work to be undone in terms of seeing ourselves as interbeings, you know, uh, intimately connected. I'm only breathing because some very nice ocean plants are, you know, <laughs> photosynthesizing at this moment, as are you, um, you know, but it's easy to separate ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something, again, I think coming from a Christian faith perspective, which we have to give an account of, right, that some of our core texts do elevate humanity in ways that have been unhelpful. Um, and, and, in, and I think in the counter in, in helpful ways, one of my other teachers in seminary, you know, talked about going to the Earth Summit in Rio. And he said, what a strange thing that here we have an Earth Summit and only one species bothers to show up. <laughs> um, <laughs> But he said that to say, right, we have like our organizing capacity and our plan, like we have, we have a role to play and it's such a needed one, but realizing we're not the only one playing some pretty amazing roles to me is, is moving. Um, so if you have questions, again, pop them in the chat. We will go till about 10 after, cause we started a bit late. We wanna give a full hour just so you know where we're headed. So one of the questions I know just from the introduction, you finished this book really before sort of COVID struck, <laughs> you finished it whilst um, we still had what I affectionately refer to as the former guy, <laughs> uh, president in, in the United States. What I'm curious in the time since you wrote and now with these major world shifts, both with COVID, with other shifts in the world, certainly a new administration in the United States, which does impact some of these global agreements, would you update anything? Would there be any pieces you might reflect on or riff on there? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, I think it's really critical to say that in 2019, we were still experiencing the mass climate marches. Uh, mm -hmm. Many people on this call will have participated in them or know someone who did. And what's exciting about that is by 2020, one in 10 people on earth now lives in a place that has declared a climate emergency. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people during COVID were concerned um, COVID caused what we call in, in journalism circles um, a, a media eclipse, which means you almost only heard about COVID, uh, you know, and many other issues of importance kind of fell away and we didn't hear about them. And that led a lot of people to be concerned that climate change just fell off the map and nobody was still engaged. But the research shows that in fact, uh, levels of concern around climate change not only held strong, but in many cases increased as a result of, of COVID. So people really recognizing our dependency on the planet and, and the connections between climate change and the kinds of issues that we face around the world. Mm -hmm. And so um, if things moved online often rather than face-to-face -face because they couldn't be face-to-face, -face, but the amount of activity around climate change organizing has been really high, which is why you know, one of the things when uh, President Biden uh, on his first day of office, you know, he rejoined the Paris Accord of climate change. And what was exciting to me was not just that that's a very good thing to do, and I'm very glad to see it, but it meant that climate change had shifted so much from being a divisive issue in the United States to being actually a, an issue that brought people together. Mm -hmm. And he would not have chosen that if he still saw it as divisive because his, his priority is, of course, to bring together a country that's quite divided. And so just to even see the shift in our way that we think about climate change as now a unifying concept in the United States is really exciting. And I think we're seeing a lot of important work, especially around the oceans and climate change, even in the last couple of weeks, uh, major declarations around that coming out of the United States. So to my mind, there's a lot going on, certainly lots around renewable energy, eclipsing you know, fossil fuels. We see another big trend, a lot of universities now um, divesting their investments. I, I used to look only 
primarily in science pages for my examples of solutions. And I would say over this last year, I'm looking so much at financial pages because oh. investors are demanding. We saw it uh, just at the G7 summit, you know, demanding action around these issues uh, in terms of where their investments are going and making companies move in that way in the same way that we see the same demands around social justice issues. So I, I feel like there's a lot going on very quickly. Um, years ago, I created a hashtag called hashtag ocean optimism with two other people. Um, it's over a hundred million shares now and it's all um, crowdsourced examples of ocean successes. Um, and, and what's exciting about those, there's a conservation optimism, there's an earth optimism that comes out of the Smithsonian Institution. <clears throat> they're, they're wonderful in the sense that you can see on a daily basis, things that are shifting um, that you might wanna pay attention to that are that are maybe of interest to you specifically. Yeah, that's helpful, thank you. You're welcome. A <laughs> um, couple of questions here from the chat, just <clears throat> just up a bit. Um, well, just speaking there about journalism, a question about sources and sites for solutions-based journalism. Um, somebody says in Vancouver, the TAI seems good. Are there other sites you recommend, Canadian or otherwise? Yeah, TAI is really good. I mentioned Grist before they do something called the Beacon. CBC runs, um, if you just do CBC and solutions, you'll see one there. BBC has a great podcast called People Fixing the World uh, mm -hmm. that uses examples from all over. The Guardian has a regular uh, beat that looks at solutions journalism. So, and, and you can even just, in a Google search, um, I was working with teachers not so long ago and we were talking about genocide um, and climate change. And just by using keywords like genocide, solutions, orientation, you know, these sorts of searches, you'll find your way eventually to solutions oriented materials. And so it's even thinking about adding that or, you know, things changing for the better or recent successes, these sorts of keywords in a regular Google search can often take you to a different place. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 really helpful. I mean, you tell you tell the story in the book, and uh, it's not quite my story to tell. But one of our book group members, Brianna, you know, shared um, this quote that that you had read um, in her own story, having left a, a one career in, I believe, nursing and going back to school. And you had a quote where you said that we're given an ecological education with the promise that we'll do, we'll first tell you how bad it is. And then in the second half, we'll, we'll give you some options on how we might improve, but far too often the second half has never gotten around to. <laughs> and I mean, I think that of in a school context, but honestly, just in, in conversational context, right? We can just, we can kind of spin each other on, oh yeah, isn't it terrible? And you know, this last week we, we had a big heat wave in Victoria, you, as you know, and man, that, that could, we could spin each other into a lot of doom about that pretty quickly. Do you see the solutions based as, as one way of kind of opening some space in that to say, yes, of course, this is a problem, like, this is a problem, this is an emergency, but what, what to do with it? Um, is that how you would position that? Yeah, I, thanks for that, Matt. I think one of the real challenges is if you and I were talking about politics or we we're talking about sports, we would not think of jumping into a conversation without kind of being a little bit up to date, you know, with, with what's going on in that okay. basketball team or what's going yeah. on in hockey or, you know, we, we don't just talk generalize generally about hockey, you know, we, we know what's going on. Whereas when we talk about the environment, there's a real tendency because of this doom and gloom narrative to assume that nothing changes for the better. And right. so then we're often talking without any current information. Right. And so I think the really critical part of this is this time stamped information. And what I mean by that is, you know, what just happened at the G7 summit? You know, what, what were investors asking of those yeah. countries? You know, what is going on? So really uh, holding ourselves accountable to be up to date right. on it, how many, I, I like to say, you know, I, I think it was last year, there were something like 71 countries had signed on to climate being climate, or sorry, being carbon neutral, you know, by, by 2050. Now it's over 120 countries, you know, so just, recognizing and and sort of expecting ourselves to be as up to date right. about these issues as we would be about any other issue and right. it's it, it it's it's really this legacy of timelessness that that undermines our i think it really undermines us because as soon as we're speaking generalizably 
then um, it's very easy to get into that vortex of doom. Yeah. And, and I think as soon as you shift into, okay, what is going on? And, and, you know, which things went better? Like, for example, during COVID, suddenly all plastic bags were coming back, remember? And because right. there was the whole idea that they were safer for us. Yeah. Well, I, I knew that 170 countries had, had already signed on to various forms of single-use plastic bag bans or tariffs or others. So I kind of felt like that's not going to last, you know, but if you look at the momentum is really there. And that is, in fact, what happened. You know, it went the wrong way for a while and then it started moving back in the way it needed to be going. And so when we know content and we have a sense of what's changing and we expect ourselves to be up to date, then I think we really see the world quite differently. Right. Yeah, that, that is really helpful. And I think that's probably one of the things that came through in this book group is, you know, part of part of the ask, I think of this book is that to be, to be more engaged and to go, and we don't know where to find that information. Well, let's, let's find out where to find it and to dig. And that, that's a really helpful analogy. Um, it's, you know, it'd be fascinating to sit around and talk about, you know, how terrible, uh, the team is that lost five years ago, <laughs> but actually to observe the current trend. That's really helpful. Uh, another related question on sort of language and, and, and information, I guess, is, um, a, there's a there's been a push to talk less about climate change and more about climate emergency to stress the the urgency and you you kind of deal with that I think in a pretty nuanced way in the book to say there is urgency and yet certainly the way that we present that and talk about that can help or hinder our ability to actually respond Do, can you say a little bit about that yeah I mean I think it is really astonishing that one in ten people live in a place that has declared a climate emergency you know on the whole planet. You know, that's astonishing. And one of the positive things I see is that when you declare a climate emergency, it sets up the expectation for plans and policies to deal with that emergency. Mm -hmm. And so even though it sounds like emergency would be a negative thing, it, it's actually recognizing the importance and urgency of something and then putting it in play. And I think what we're seeing going on this year mm -hmm. is that last year the emergencies were set and this year we see, um, you know, a lot of times it's at the level of cities. Cities are very impactful when it comes to um, climate change and actions around climate change. And so many cities will have a climate emergency plan now in place. And that's, again, very helpful uh, in terms of advocacy. We can say, okay, what is the climate emergency plan for this school district? Or what is it for this city? Or what is it for this province or, you know, this country? And then, and then push our politicians to, to enact the things that they've put in that plan or to, or to up them. Yeah, that's helpful. So, I mean, we could we could hear that right from afar and think, oh, my gosh, emergency. You know, it's like a 10, 10 alarms ringing at once. How are we going to deal with this? Um, and yet you're suggesting actually that can that can trigger some, you know, pull some levers that that enable other action to flow from it. Um, I guess the flip side of that is you talk about how when there's a mismatch, right, between our sense of the scope and urgency of a problem and the scope and ability of our personal agency response, it can be, it can be, um, you know, disempowering. Um, so how do you, how do you think about that? I mean, I, I don't, I'm skeptical of boiling, you know, world large problems down to how we as individuals deal with it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yet, you know, of course the, you know, the, the demand for divestment um, isn't necessarily always coming from sort of strong ethical <laughs> bounds. It's sometimes coming from pressure, right? That, that humans put. So can you just say a little bit about how you, how do you deal with that? How do you think about human agency in terms of push, putting pressure and where to, where to exercise that? There's a lot of, um, helpful places to look. One is there's something called Project Drawdown. And what that is a is a big data source that looks across sort of all activities humans might be engaged in and which ones have the biggest impact in terms of climate change. And, and number one on that list for a long time, I think it's still number one, I'd have to check again, um, was around refrigerants, you know, and you think, oh, refrigerants, what's that got to do with me? But but refrigerants are actually, um, you know, really important in terms of air conditioning and all that of that sort of thing. And those are a major cause of, of, of climate disruption. And so, but helpful to know that the same international body that successfully dealt with the ozone hole um, is the 
same body now dealing with refrigerants. In fact, the Kigali agreement has now been going for five years and is having some very positive impacts on that issue. So I think being aware of some of these things that are going on at the international level is really helpful. I know there was a tension often for people between individual actions. Like we know that how you get around, how much plant-based food you eat, um, these sorts of things are really impactful. Uh, in terms of our day-to-day -day practices. Um, but there was a tension feeling like, do you focus more on the, you know, the top 20 um, major corporations that are yeah. climate emitters, or do you think in terms of individual action? And, and when I look at the research, both are really important, you know, and, and we don't have to do less of one in order to do more of the other. And yeah. so when you look at the cumulative impact of what we see in these younger people, for example, is an increase in plant-based eating. We know that Canada Food Guide now is plant-based protein focused. You know, we know it's better for our health and it has significant Im impacts in terms of uh, biodiversity loss and climate change benefits. And so when, when we see these trends emerging and we know now that it's much easier to, to get great, you know, tasting vegan food or whatever, or there's many more people who are flexitarians, that's great to just move in that direction yourself and still hold other companies accountable for their actions. Um, you know, both, both are really important. So I suppose what I'm answering Matt is all of these levels really matter. And that wherever you, I, I really believe that in the same way there's diversity of life on earth, there's diversity of people and whatever you're most passionate about, you can really use that, you know, certainly seeing lots of craftivism projects around, uh, to, you know, for the better of wildlife. And so I think that when we come as our authentic selves uh, and we see ourselves as parts of collectives that care about things we care about, we're much more impactful and we're much more likely to stay with those things rather than thinking there's three things all of us are supposed to do. Right. Yeah, that's re that's really helpful, and um, and I do think, in a way, you know, for many many years in my work with Arasha, people wanted that. Give me the top ten things to do, and there was a you know the number of books that were written, ninety nine solutions that you can take, right. and and it's I think it swung the other way where there's a, a broader awareness now that well some of the core issues they're very systemic, they're going to take sustained effort that transcends just what I do with my little household, etc. And I think that's right and important, and it misses. The one thing I think it misses is the way that those personal and household practices can can really form us, right? Um, can really shape us. So I had someone in a class I was teaching years ago told me about, um, you know, becoming aware. They lived in Saskatchewan. They had become aware of the world water crisis, and so every morning when they got up to wash their face, they felt terrible. They were running this cold water to let it warm. And so every morning they would put a bowl and capture the water and, you know, then use it to boil tea or to feed the house plants. And then they said, well, one day my partner came in and said, you know, there's no real water crisis in Saskatchewan. Like you're not going to save the world's water crisis by a little bowl in Saskatchewan. And this poor person was so, so disempowered. They just stopped doing it. Right. And I said, well, that may be that may be technically true. Your individual piece won't, but but think about how much it's changed your experience of water, right? To to take that on, and and that's going to actually unlock places where you do think about broader impacts and how you can can make those. So I do think you're right. We have to see the different scales as interlocking, um, and hopefully mutually informing, drawing us backwards and forwards, right between them. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one place where. Um, you know, social media is fraught with all kinds of problems, but we certainly do see that it also has this capacity to bring together collectives of people who maybe all care about water, you yeah. know, and are, are doing something in a way that's reinforcing each other's actions. And I, yeah. and I think that um, we, we know, for example, the likelihood of putting solar panels on your roof is increased when your neighbors do it. You know, like I, 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 I think I said in the book, you know, I hang clothes on the line because my friend Shannon does it, you know, not only do I know it's the right thing to do, but I, I do it because Shannon does it, you know, so yeah. I think um, there's nothing wrong with do, doing practices that, are, that have a positive impact for the earth and each other yeah. uh, as part of a practice. You know? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot right about it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, a few more questions here. Um, well, a comment and question, uh, someone writing from an Asian context, not sure plastic ban uh, bans are working here. And I also face ignorance from a TikTok driven young youth community. Mm -hmm. um, 
we have a climate emergency here and still the youth seem to reacting on a small level. Do you have or know of partnerships or collaboration with youth related influencers in social media? I know you have some of that in the book. Could you share a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, and I appreciate that. And I think one of the interesting things around plastic bag bans is if you look across those ones, you know, some work very well as tariffs, some work well as fines, some work well as actual write out bans, you know, so there's a lot of variety in, in what works um, and, and how to tailor it to different contexts. Um, a group that I'm really interested in right now is called the Intergenerational Environmental Council. Hmm. And they are social media influencers who are um, really, I think, of our, of our time, you know, they, their positionality around their own identities is very, is, is what is first and foremost, what you see, you know, um, the, I, there's one person who I really like to follow who's, who goes by the nomaker of, you know, brown queer vegan and, and the kinds of issues that he's looking at, um, including things like shame around um, homeless food opportunities mm -hmm. and, and how that ties to the environment, you know, these kinds of really bringing our full identities to this. And I, and I think that's a big part of what's going on in the youth social movement. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one I would look at right away mm -hmm. and just, just see what's there. Yeah, thank you, Intergenerational Environmental Council. That's great, thank you. Um, well, this <laughs> kind of, I think a fun question, but because we're speaking of, of younger people, someone asks here, have you sent Greta Thunberg a copy of your book? <laughs> if not, you should. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I really should. And I, I think I mentioned Hope Matters. I should do that. I, I will do that because I'm a big fan of hers too. And I, I think um, she she's, uh, has made statements about being anti-hope. Yeah. Uh, but what I think she's talking about, if I were to say my interpretation of what she's talking about, and I'm, I'm in no way saying, I'm not trying to put words into her mouth, but as I hear her speaking, I think what she's anti is anti-wishing. And, yeah. and when I think of wishing, wishing is about, you know, hoping someone comes along and saves you and, and you really have very little agency. Whereas when I'm talking about hope, I'm really talking about evidence-based hope where we can see, you know, these actions are having these impacts. Um, and so I think she's using hope, but she's talking about it as a kind of disempowering, disengaging um, wishfulness. Yeah. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, that's that's helpful qualification on on her, yeah. her work. We'll do that. OK, I promise to do that when I arrive at my destination. <laughs> Um, okay, a question here about really, uh, I guess, about the value, the role of the arts. Uh, someone, uh, I'm working on a project to bring local environmental poetry together, the desire to enable readers to experience the natural world more vividly and to feel empowered to care. Any thoughts, insights on the value of arts in encouraging hope? Ah, oh, huge, hugely important. In fact, I would say, so um, Matt had mentioned earlier about environmental studies students often in classes, uh, you know, uh, only hearing about problems and never getting to the solutions part of a course. Uh, the same is true with environmental arts. A lot of environmental art is in this problem identification mode. And there's real need for art that looks in a broader way, you know, that is solutions oriented as well. Um, and I will say, I, I just became aware not so long ago that in the Climate Change Convention, the arts, it's in terms of arts as, a, as an important engager from an emotional standpoint, is not present in that convention. So again, a huge gap, uh, because we know that the arts are one of the primary ways that we can engage our emotions around things. So 100% supportive. We also know that during COVID-19, people's engagement with crafts and all kinds of other arts dramatically increased. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, a population around the world that is expressing itself uh, in artistic ways uh, that we haven't seen since uh, the end of World War II. And so I think it's an exciting time to be thinking about the arts in a much broader way about in the solutions orientation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, any comments on the potential for Cascadia to be a climate refuge or not? Yesterday, the uh, Washington Post had an op-ed uh, 
deflating that hope saying i have known hot places the northwest heat wave feels apocalyptic <laughs> so i guess the background there it was thought that this region that that i'm in that you are i think you're still in driving uh, on your way south would be a, a place of refuge right because it is it's moderate temperature and, and we have some um stability and yet of course with these heat waves like we just saw uh, thoughts about that Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's really important not to just abandon ideas, you know, in the midst of, of uh, difficult times. Yeah. And we certainly know, you know, incredible ecological restoration work being done in this area when the Elwa Dam was opened up, the largest uh, opening up dam in U.S. history. Uh, within 48 hours, there was return of salmon to those rivers. And so I think the resilience of ecosystems is extraordinary. We know that at Mount St. Helens, uh, you know, it blew off all of these mountains and, and the recovery of the natural trees was faster than the replanted trees. Yeah. And so, um, and all of Suzanne Samard's wonderful work on, on these fungal root networks that, that put forests together as communities. And, and she now talks about both forests as sort of sharing um, mm -hmm. a collective wisdom you know, so I, I think that the recognition of the Salish Sea, of the Cascadia, and thinking about the resilience of these areas is really key, and, and how we bring to bear this ecological restoration um, that's so important. A lot of work has been done, people may not realize this, along the highways that I've just been traveling on, of, of opening up those culverts so that fish can move through again instead of being cemented down, um, has had a real positive impact on fisheries. And so we see these actions, but we, we maybe don't account for how important they are cumulatively. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's helpful. And again, I think points us in some ways back, right, to the sense that the world is, uh, we talked about this recently when we chatted by phone, that the, that the world is fundamentally alive and, and responding in real time, the same way that you and I are, right? So whatever happened at breakfast in the family that disrupted my day or that, that we're carrying that and we're working with that and, and seeing actually so are the trees in ways that we're not even fully aware of. So are uh, other, other species and, and allowing that to be a, a part of the hope, right? A part of the picture um, that, that, that kind of re, reignites our, our sort of fire to do this work, I think is, is one of the things I'm really taking away from this book. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. And I, I think it's helpful for those who are in Canada specifically to realize that in the last decade, um, all of the newest national parks have either been led or co-led by First Nations. Mm. And so this recognition of Indigenous cultures and relationship to the land and what that then means about uh, the place of people within ecosystems and what that means for ecological restoration is, is a whole um, important conversation that is shifting dramatically in Canada mm -hmm. as part of a reconciliation process and also an ecological process. And so, again, ideas are always moving just as the earth is always uh, alive and moving. And, and so as we, as we recognize that, then we're not thinking so much about, you know, people here, wildlife there, we're thinking much more in an integrated way. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I think, um, I mean, I think that's an important sort of place for us as we begin to draw to a close too, for us, you know, who do come at this from a Christian faith perspective to recognize, uh, you know, we thought we had it all figured out in so many ways around the earth, certainly around our engagement with indigenous peoples. And this is a time of reckoning, of coming to face the hard realities, the violent realities of that past uh, and, and of a kind of turning. I mean, if there's one gift that I think the church can can offer in terms of language for the environmental movement it would be language around around confession and repentance that we can say we've done this wrong but we can seek to turn and start to do it right together and i think it's a, i think we're really at a, a place of of welcoming that collectively and naming that and saying we didn't know the half of it when it comes to i mean goodness the the uh, story you've told about the humpback whales is just the start so thank you so much. Thank you for this book, for opening our, our eyes and our minds, our, certainly our imaginations, I think is one of the key, the key pieces to, to have a broadening imagination for how we could really live well on this planet together. And um, I encourage all, all of you who are with us here to uh, check out the book. Uh, I've talked to some colleagues in other parts of Canada at Arasha saying, you go and do a study on this book. It was such a rich dialogue. So thank you, Ellen, very much for joining us and for this rich conversation.
You're welcome. And thank you so Matt. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. And to all of you uh, for taking the time. I always think about non-renewable life moments. I really appreciate you spending your non-renewable life moments <laughs> yeah. in this conversation. Um, and that if you think about one of the last things I just wanted to say is that emotions are contagious. Mm. They're contagious face to face and they're contagious online. We know that now from a massive study done in 2014. And so if you think about it, when you are sharing things, uh, you have incredible power to, to help um, build up someone's agency uh, in an evidence-based way or, yeah. to, or to work against that. And so I think just to be aware of that is a, is a very powerful thing. So this, I'm glad we had this contagious time together. It's great to talk with you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And yeah, thanks all of you for joining and uh, for uh, your curiosity about this conversation, the work of Arasha Canada, as I mentioned, um, you can find it online, arasha.ca in, in Canada, also in other countries around the world. If you look up Arasha International um, on Facebook or come visit one of our centers, we will send you a very brief evaluation that'll be going out uh, shortly just to give us input as we kind of work out these ongoing talks. And we will have a recording. I know that question was asked. So this will be recorded. That'll be up on the uh, YouTube page for Arasha Canada. And I'd say within a week, we'll certainly send a link around to those of you that have registered and you can share that widely. And the very last thing is our next Arasha talk on the 19th of August at 5 p.m. Stories from Arasha's conservation work across Canada from our very own conservation science team. So what are the, some of the things that these folk are learning and doing and exploring? Um, I'll pop a link to that in the chat here. If you're curious about that, it should be another rich conversation. And that does us. So thank you again very much to Ellen. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you again. <laughs>